Bibles, I'd like you to turn this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 this morning. We will be there in just a moment. Our theme this year is rooted in Him, rooted in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7 has been or will be our theme verse for this year. You see it on the signs around me and behind me. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul instructs us with these words, beginning in verse number 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Verse number 7, rooted and built up in him. The fact is that we are called, we are called to be rooted and to be built up in him, that is Jesus Christ. And established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now just so you know and don't miss this, that when we are saved, when we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, God has not saved us to have an empty, all right, fruitless life. We don't just get the scraps of life once we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. This idea here is that someone who is being rooted, rooted and built up will be overflowing with the benefits that God brings. That they'll have joy that is overflowing. Jesus said this in the book of John over and over. He said, I'm here that you might have joy and that your joy would be abundant. All right, God wants to do something marvelous and big in your life, not something small. I've met some, some Christians who are only allowing God to do a small work in their life. They're not always the most joyful ones, are they? They're not always the ones who have the smile or, or the deep peace that comes from knowing their Savior in a full way. They're not the ones who are being grateful. Usually if someone is allowing God to do a small work in their life, you can tell it's written all over their face, all over their body, all over their speech, all over their life. And in this passage, we're commanded, we're instructed to be rooted and built up in him. Slide down to verse number 10 in Colossians chapter 2. It says, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Lord... This morning, we come to you and we ask for your help. Lord, I pray that this morning you would help me to say those things that would represent your word clearly and well. Lord, I'm asking that your word would touch us and change us today. Lord, that this text, as we look in Corinthians, would come alive in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. And I ask that there's decisions that need to be made to please you that today they would be made. And if there's someone or people here who don't know you as their Savior, that today they would trust in you. Lord, I need your help. Lord, we need your help. We give you this time, and I ask you to do something that would be eternal in nature today. That the effects would not stop this side of heaven. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Your finger is there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and we'll be there in just a moment. But I want you to imagine for a moment that you are now having the opportunity to build your dream home. You and your spouse have spent a lot of time carefully getting the plans drawn up just like you want them. You've got the dining room right where you want it. You've got the master suite just exactly like you want it. You've got the basement. You've got the, you've got the deck. And, and every part of the house is exactly what you want. You've painstakingly gone over these plans uh, hundreds of times. And now you've hired a builder. You know because of just life, and you know this without having built a house, that there are some good builders and there are some poor builders out in this world. There are some who build great houses and great structures and some that build cheap workmanship. But you've hired the best. You've got a builder on, on call on retainer here that's built over 100,000 successful completed homes and everyone loves them. He does really good work. When he says he's going to be there, 
he's there. What he says that he will do, he does. When it's time for the plumbing, the plumbing gets done. When it's time for the electrical work, the electrical work gets done. His attention to detail, his ability to handle any curveball thrown at him is second to none. He has great credentials, impeccable past performances, and you were blessed enough and lucky enough to hire him. So you break ground. You break ground on your dream home. It's in the perfect spot overlooking four million acres. In the middle of nowhere, but really close to everything. There's no traffic, but there's no need because people are close enough so no one will attack you because you're all alone. It's the perfect spot. You have a big pond, but no one can get hurt. You have acres and acres. It mysteriously has paths already cleared in it. It is literally the perfect spot in the world. The builder brings out his excavator, big equipment. They begin to dig a hole in the ground. You're out there eagerly watching this foundation being put in, and it is just thrilling to watch concrete walls being poured. You're like, wow. I've never seen better concrete poured in my life. Every wall is perfectly squared up. Every corner finished well. From there, they began to put the rough framing in place. The foundation goes down, the rough framing goes in, and it's all bare studs, but, but something happens. Something happens in your mind, and you get a little impatient. I don't know about you, but I'm the most patient person I know. Are you with me? Are you with me? Anybody ever have impatience in their life? Is it just me? Come on. Come on. We need some confession. Confession's good for the soul. Anybody else in patient in life? And you're like, no, Pastor, I'm always patient. I wait for everything in, in perfect timing. I'm just, I'm just perfect. Well, bless your heart. Bless your heart. We'll talk about lying next week. But you're impatient. You see the studs, you've seen the foundation, you've planned, and you've got the right, the right builder. Everything's there. The plans are perfect, but you can't wait to move in. Plumbing's not going fast enough. Electrical work, my goodness, will they ever get it done? How hard can it be to pull some wires? How hard can it be to slap a few, few boards up? So one day... You've had enough. You go onto the work site, the job site, and you see there, there's wires and boards, and you grab a few wires, you grab a few boards, and begin to just construct your own master bedroom. And in two short hours, you can move into your bedroom. So that night, you move in. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> you move in that night. And it rains. No problem. No problem. All right, you're in your house. You got a roof over your head. You've got wires in the wall. You've got plumbing in the bathroom. As you lay there in bed, all of a sudden you realize drip, drip, drip. The roof is leaking. You go to flip on the light and pff, pff, shorts out. Well, this is great. You grab your flashlight. Go to the bathroom, turn on the water, and it shoots up and hits you in the face. I want us to stop for a moment this morning and consider something. If that were our scenario, and then you were to call up your builder and say, listen, I am sick of you. I can't believe that you would make a leaky roof, electrical shorting, broken plumbing, master suite for me. What's wrong with you? The builder would say, I didn't build that. You did. Any time, any time that you and I set aside the master architect and build our structure ourselves, we will have failure. In Colossians chapter 2, the Bible says, rooted and built up in him. 
There's two metaphors in this passage, in that passage, Colossians chapter 2. There's the rooted, the idea of a tree. Built up is the idea of a building. And the concept here in Colossians chapter 2 is that we are to be built up or the right building or to be reared up according to his master plans with Jesus Christ as the master architect. He comes with impeccable credentials. He comes with past successes successfully completed projects. He is the builder who cannot make a mistake. If you have your Bibles, look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul brings some light on how we're God's building. This morning, I want to spend just a few moments looking at this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, to make sure that our structure is a structure to his plans, not my plans or your plans. First Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 9. The Bible says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's what? Building. What is that? A building. A building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another build thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Don't miss what Paul is saying here. Paul is not saying that he has made this foundation. He's saying, listen, I have provided the, the, the opportunity for you to know the foundation from Jesus Christ himself. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. In this passage, I believe we have four concepts that instruct us about the building and to be built up, to be reared up, to have a structure that would be in accordance to God's plan. My friends, I don't want my plan for my life. I don't want you to have your plan because your plan and my plan are always inferior to God's plan. Remember once in college, a teacher, a professor said this, he said, you don't want the blueprints for your life. I remember that day in that class thinking about that statement and my mind went off a little rabbit trail because I thought to myself, I wouldn't mind the blueprints for my life. I wouldn't mind knowing at that point who I'm going to marry and where I'm going to work. The professor went on to say, if you had the blueprints for your life, what you would do is you would pick and choose what God would do in your life. And my friends, the longer I live, the more true that statement becomes. There are things in my life that I would choose over and over and over again. This is wonderful. And there are things in my life, and I'm sure in your life, that I would never go back through. And I would say, you know what, Lord? I like this one, and I like this one, and I like this one, and these nine things, I'm just going to push aside. I don't want that this week or next week or any week. The Bible says that I'm supposed to be built up, reared up, or a structure in Jesus Christ. And Paul here says there's some ways to do that and ways not. There are four concepts. The first concept here this morning is awareness. Awareness. The Bible says in this passage, but let every man take heed how he build thereupon. If you think this will just happen, that you'll be built the right way in Jesus Christ just by accident, then you've missed it. Your life will no more look like what it ought to with Jesus Christ than if you were to just grab some nails and some boards and begin to just put a house up as you're going along. You may have a wall, you may have a roof, but it will not be squared up. It will not be strong. It will not be beautiful. It'll look like some boys and some girls grabbed some boards and made their own tree fort in the backyard. And yet there are lives every day of the week. Those who are Christians, those who know better, who have grabbed some boards and grabbed some nails, and they're not even thinking about it. The Bible says, take heed. We ought to have an awareness. 
for what's going on if you think that you will just naturally be spiritual. You won't be. If you think that your kids will just naturally please God, they won't. If you think that that a Christian life, a life that pleases God, will just happen, it won't. So let every man take heed. If you think that you can do it better, you've missed it. If I had a dollar, well, I know what the Bible says, but I think. I know what God wants me to do, but I feel. My friend, I, know, I mean no disrespect to you, but quite frankly, I don't care what you think. I care what God thinks. In this context, I don't care what you feel. Or I understand what I'm saying. I'm not being heartless, but I care what God says and what God feels. If we think, if I think, if you think that we can do it better, we are sadly mistaken. I'm not. I am not a carpenter. They usually say, measure twice, cut once. What I do, measure three times, cut four times, and drive back to the store to buy another piece of wood. There are some men and women in this room who can, with wood, do beautiful things. Things that I can only dream of. I'm like, look, I made a box. My wife's like, that, that, that's a box? Oh, that's nice. It's a cute box. Looks more like a, a mess. <laughs> but some of you have that ability. It's special. My friends, God is the master architect. He always does it better. If I think I can do it better, and I tell you, that is a lie of the devil. And it sneaks into our minds, doesn't it? I know this situation. I know how to solve it. I can do it better. I know how to fix this particular uh, problem. I can do it better. I know what's best for me. I can do it better. Anytime we think we can do it better, we will make a mess. Number one, there's awareness. Number two, there's authority. Look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of Jesus Christ in this passage is referring to salvation and faith and simple faith in Jesus Christ. A building with no foundation or a poor foundation will not last. You can use the finest materials on the top, but if you don't have a good foundation, that building will not last. There's authority in this passage that the foundation has to come from Jesus Christ. Colossians, rooted and built up in him. The foundation must come from Christ. He is the foundation for our life. He is the base. He is the reason uh, that we're here. Everything we do must fit inside of his pattern for our life. A faulty foundation such as wealth or security or success or prosperity will always produce a doomed structure. See, if you not put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have no foundation. This morning, my friend, if you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how God loves you. He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins, to forgive your sins, to give you a home in heaven. And this is that foundation. We sang that song, I'm on the winning side. That is that faith in Jesus Christ to believe that he is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for all the sins, and that by believing in him to save you, he will save you. That is faith in Jesus. We don't have a faith in Jesus. We don't have a foundation in Jesus. I read about a study in an agricultural school in Iowa. The study went that, that all, out of 100 bushels of corn from an acre, in addition to the hours of the farmer's labor, it required 4 million pounds of water, 6,800 pounds of oxygen, 5,200 pounds of carbon, 160 pounds of nitrogen, 125 pounds of potassium, 75 pounds of yellow sulfur, and other elements too numerous to list. 
in addition to these things, which no man can produce, rain and sunshine at the right time are critical. And they concluded from their study that of the 100 bushels of corn from one acre, only 5% could be attributed to the efforts of the farmer. The other 95% was outside of his control. And my friends, that is true in your life and my life. That our life, they're in his hands. Not only is there awareness, there's authority. But number three, I, th- I see alternatives. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. What Paul in the Bible is teaching us here is that in our life there are two kinds of building materials. There are those things that are temporal and those things that are eternal. There are those things that are worthless, wood, hay, stubble, in this particular analogy, and those things that are valuable, precious, gold, silver, these precious stones. Then in my life, I can, I can look at both, both building materials and I can either follow the valuable side, the side that would please God, that would build a building worthy of his, of his being and structure, or I can build it with what is worthless and temporal. Interesting, though, the Bible says both will build a structure. Both will build a structure. In this passage, the gold will build a structure and the wood will. The hay and the stubble. Silver and precious stones, both will build a structure, but only one is worthy of the foundation of Jesus Christ. Only one is according to the plan of the master architect. Only one will withstand the reckoning of the Savior. Only one is worthwhile, the other is useless. You see, the issue is here that we are in a temple building process. Verse number 16, this passage says this, What know ye not that you are the temple of God? You see, we're trying to build something worthy of Jesus Christ according to his plan. We had science fair here at the school a little while ago. I, though this is not the same sentiment for every parent, I enjoy science fair. I love it. My son, maybe not so much, I enjoy it. We decided this year to do uh, a match Rocket, a match rocket science experiment. Now, match rockets are you take a head of a match and you build a little rocket about this big from aluminum foil with the head of a match inside of it. You put it onto a tube, you put fire underneath, and the rocket launches, in theory, and we were testing uh, the, the, the uh, uh, length of the fins if it affected the flight path of the rocket. All right, so as a male, anything that explodes is good. And we had found some instructions about how to make these match rockets. And you, you know, snipped off the head of the match and you carefully wrapped this uh, foil around a bamboo skewer. If you want instructions later on, come see me. I'll be happy to give them to you. Enjoyable. Don't launch them inside. It's not good. I didn't. I didn't. But, but, as a man, if one match head is good, come on now, come on now. All right, yeah, because you're like, what happens? I will tell you what happens. So we're launching these, and we had to, we had to restructure it because we were, didn't follow the instructions exactly right, and so the first ones weren't tight enough, so they didn't launch right. But then we got one, the first one that launched for us probably launched, what, Johnny, how many, 20, or how was the first one, 20 feet? I mean, whew, takes off. I got a video of it. This fire comes out the back end, and it takes off. And as men, you giggle because this thing, like, whew, it's gone. And I'm like, let's try this double I'm thinking, this thing, I'm going to the moon. I'm going to the moon, baby. (laughs) This thing, NASA's going to be calling me. All right, Elon Musk, hey, SpaceX has some uh, openings. We we need need J.D. Howell. Sorry, I'm a pastor. I can't can't stop my my much needful work for to be a rocket scientist. But I may fit you in. So I'll put this thing on here, right? Because listen, I know better. I know better than the plans that I found. I know better. I know the materials that, that you say I should use, but I know the materials that I want to use. So I made this thing, wrapped it up. 
James on this one, lit this thing. The design that we got online worked really, really, really well. We got it tuned in just right. The design that J.D. Howell invented goes like four feet in the air and goes, poof, poof, explosion. I learned a very real fact about poor design and explosives. Now, you know what? I had an alternative there. I could have chosen the right materials. And if I chose the right materials, the previous test showed, the examples I saw, Edward and I had done, worked just fine. But the minute that I got my own self involved inside of it, J.D. Howe made a mess. My friends, there's two alternatives here. We can build with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. The Bible will teach us in just a moment briefly like what that looks like. But I promise you this. I promise you this. You build with the wrong material, you'll build a structure. It'll be a structure, but it'll fail. It won't last. You, you can't defeat it. It's wrong. There's alternatives here, and we're called to use the right one. And then number three, there's accountability. Verse number 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. We'll be held accountable for how we build. We'll be rewarded for what we've built. What does it look like to build in God's way? Let me give you three brief statements about building God's way. Number one, to build God's way is to embrace his timing. To build God's way is to embrace his timing. Just like any house, things have to go in the right order. Embrace his timing. You can't put the doors on if there's no walls or wood up. You can't put the roof on if nothing's there. And in my life and your life, we won't build correctly if we don't embrace his timing. But God, you're not working fast enough. You ever felt that before? You ever wish you could buy God an alarm clock? I have. I'll be honest, I have. I'm like, God, ooh, I've been praying. You need to show up. And I know God's never late, but sometimes I feel like he cuts it awful close. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thought that too. They went into the fire. No doubt they would have before that preferred to stop before the fire. Now, after the fire, they didn't care, right? When they're dancing around that fire, they thought, God, your timing is perfect. But that heat splashing on their face, Lord, alarm clock time. To build the structure correctly is to embrace God's timing in life. And not just allow God's timing, but embrace it. Lord, whatever timing you ordain, that's good. I don't feel you're working fast enough. But Lord, you know best. I trust you, the master architect, to know the time that is best. Number two is to look to his perspective. In our life, we're going to look at life sometimes and we don't see it the way God sees it. To go back to the building analogy, you look at it like, boy, what are all these, well, what is this thing for right here? What is this thing for? What, what is this board here for? What, is the, what are these boards here for? What is this wire here for? When it's all done, you look at it and be like, oh my goodness, the builder knew what he was doing. But along the way, it doesn't always make sense. To build with the proper materials means to look at the things through God's perspective, through his perspective. I read a story about a man who his family doctor said, listen, he said, listen, man, you can't see. You're blind. He's like, I'm not blind, I can see just fine. He goes, no, you need glasses. He said, you need to go see the optometrist. So he goes to the optometrist and he gets a, 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 standard, a standard eye test. And like any eye test, I sat down and the, and the uh, eye doctor, optometrist said, listen, read the sign on the wall, this chart on the wall. He began to read top letters A, next, next row C, Z, Y, and R, N, S, C, V, and J, and B, O, S. The doctor said, okay. And the man said, well, how did I do? The doctor said, you did terrible. Because this chart that I showed you was not letters, it was numbers. <laughs> My friends, there's times that God's using numbers and symbols and colors 
And we're like, I don't see anything but trust and look at things through his perspective to build properly. Number three is to follow his instruction. Follow his instruction. Maybe you're familiar with the story of the three little pigs. Each of the pigs built a different structure. But only one structure lasted. Only one provided safety. Only one in the three little pigs maintained the integrity that produced what the intended result was supposed to be, protection from the big, bad wolf. I guarantee the Apostle Paul never heard the story of the three little pigs. But I imagine that the Apostle Paul would appreciate the story of the three little pigs. He would appreciate the moral of the story that what you build with and the materials you choose really matter. And the materials you choose to build with, when faced with a test, will be revealed. My friends, in your life and in my life, we can choose to use those things that are temporal, our own timing, our own perspective, our own instruction, or we can use gold and silver in his timing, his perspective, his instructions. Back in the early 1900s, a bridge built in Washington. They nicknamed the bridge Galloping Gertie. The bridge that was built is a, a place where the um, Tacoma Narrows there was designed there. It was, it was designed to span nearly mile-wide river. At that time, it had been the third largest suspension bridge at that time behind the Golden Gate Bridge and the George Washington Bridge. The designer, the architect, the engineer, intended to create stability by using standard design. But when the cost came in at over $200 million, in today's money, a cheaper option was found. Not only was a cheaper option found, the cheaper option was used. As a result, instead of stability, the bridge was extremely flexible and vulnerable to high winds. Because of the sway in the wind, the workers there named the bridge the Galloping Gertie. And when just a 40 mile an hour wind swept through the river valley on November the 7th, 1940, the bridge started twisting and buckling. Support cables snapped. And before the day was over, just four months after it was opened, by the end of the day on November 7, 1940, the bridge was in the river. Be careful. Be careful how you build.